bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't I never have, and I never will. Yeah, right. I bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, NFL Week 16 Holiday Edition. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Boxing Day. We'll run the full gamut of activities and a football feast in front of us this coming weekend as playoff races all over the National Football League continue to heat up. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only Payne Insider. Payne, a little birdie told me you were officially listed on the questionable list coming into to this weekend's games but you're going to gut it out for the good of our listeners we're here we're here baby it's all, it's all it takes right now you Focus. gotta play hurt this time of year <laughs> yes 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 so six big games on the docket i don't think uh revisiting what we saw on monday night between the green bay packers and the rams uh warrants any attention but i guess before we get into some of the games i gotta ask you one question off the top when it comes to weather this time of year, I mean, is there one handicapping approach that new better should take, or is it just kind of monitoring the forecast, hoping? Yeah, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it, right? I mean, it's it's the first thing you're doing in advance of of prepping your numbers. I mean, once you do your while you're doing it, before you do it, right? Like you're you're dumping in your data from that day's games and you're running your stuff, but you have a a close eye on some of these totals and, and really you don't necessarily have to have a strong opinion on what that number should be you just know where the market's going to go so sometimes it's just about grabbing the number and figuring out what to do with it later and you know we saw that situation and I was kind of hesitant to divulge it but we had this exact situation in Buffalo and Miami last week in that I said something to the effect of we opened 48 and a half our model said you know 45 point eight and so you're kind of just quickly grabbing a number on one side but the idea was <laughs> we really liked the over based upon the matchup that was better than the number that we spit out and we were hoping for this to get you know substantially lower and somebody got an itchy trigger finger and I think by the time we talked about it on Thursday we had already gone from 41 and a half to 43 43 and a half but there's just no signs of weather. I think this week seems a little bit more severe. Seems like it has a little bit more staying power in terms of early in the week to late in the week during game day. But yeah, I mean, it's it's something you have to be looking at every single game before you fire a bet this time of year. And sometimes even if there's not value, you got to fire it because you know where the market's going to go. And uh, that obviously opens up some some opportunities for some middles around key numbers, especially when you think about some of these totals right in the mid to low 40s and, you know, how valuable some of those numbers truly are, some of the most valuable in the entire NFL yeah, betting. Pretty world. wild when you look at the board this week. I mean, these totals that we're seeing now are reminiscent of the mid 90s where you were lucky to get to 17 to 20 points. I mean, a 32 and a half on a game we won't break down between the Saints and Browns. Obviously, some injury momentum in the Tennessee Titans game from a total that you kind of mentioned in the low 40s and even games that may not be heavily impacted by weather. We've seen some under support, an increasing trend where there's an emphasis on a little bit more of running the football this year and defense is making adjustments on the fly but uh as you said case by case basis the, and i think people yeah and the one the one you referenced there like saints browns it's not a game that that we're going to talk about on the podcast but open 39 at the peak had some 38 and a half out there and you just saw a mad dash to it even though the model wouldn't indicate value it did get as low as 31 and a half and what's crazy about that specific one is the weather got actually a little bit worse, but there was a group yesterday that said, hey, like, we're, how much lower can this possibly go? And so to, to play this middle, I think, you know, 31, 31 and a half might be the bottom out price. And, and they took a nibble and that's why we're back to like 32 and a half. It's not necessarily like an endorsement of, of going to bet over 32 and a half, but they just figured, hey, this is going to be the bottom of the, the price point on our middle. 
And so we'll just we'll just attack here. And, you know, we've seen situations over the last few years with these Browns games. You can reference one against Oakland last year where it just couldn't go low enough. And I believe there were 30 points scored in that game. And and the weather conditions appear worse for this week than than that game last year that I was referencing against the run early run off and 35 to 50 mile an hour gust there blowing across the field it should be one hell of a spectacle to watch obviously not ideal if you're looking to get Saints or Browns players into your fantasy football lineups this weekend but we'll start things off Thursday night in the tri-state area where it's the New York Jets back on full display for national audience to watch against the upstart Jacksonville Jaguars and we've seen the Jets take money throughout the course of the week and as we're recording here starting to see some two and a half pop throughout the betting market as well consensus on this game is two total at 37 the battle of the top picks in the 2021 nfl draft it almost feels like these are two teams and quarterbacks for that matter as ships passing in the night when you look at the jags four and two in their last six after starting two and six meanwhile the jets just one and four in their past five since starting six and three in the wake of that heartbreaking loss against the detroit lions last weekend the jaguars well they're seeking their fourth division title in franchise history and their past may have gotten significantly easier with the injury situation currently evolving with Ryan Tannehill in Nashville. Meanwhile, the Jets just trying to break a streak where they've lost seven straight primetime games, the longest active streak in the NFL, seeking the first primetime win since the 2018 season opener, which was the Sam Darnold debut against the Detroit Lions. Talked about weather, plenty of weather expected in this particular game here. But Payne, when you're beginning to assess the Jets, we know they're going to go with Zach Wilson. We know the strength of this team has been their defense all season long, even if they're not forcing turnovers over the last couple weeks. But the only time we saw the Jags play in a bit of inclement weather was against the Eagles. They struggled mightily. What's the one matchup you're looking for here to try and determine tonight's winner in a big AFC showdown? <laughs> that game is actually pretty funny. I think that was our worst closing line value of the Still got there for us, game. baby. Still got there for us. Four or five points worse than number. Oh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, you kind of mentioned the... You know what's at stake here for these two teams and there's some weirdness to it and some variance because it's this short week game and you know there's 90 percent chance of rain and there's some winds that are in the 17 to 22 mile per hour sustained and gusts substantially higher and you look at the pattern right now it looks like it only gets worse as the game goes on and you just like playoff important games like this to be played a little bit true and not have weather variants. And you also have that late season situation with Jacksonville basically coming off a five quarter overtime game with tons of energy and that they exerted late coming from 17 down. Now you're traveling on a short week. So it's just not this ideal situation for, for Jacksonville. But to your point, I think the biggest factor is obviously Zach Wilson. You know, I went back and watched last week because to your point, the the passing yards didn't really match the efficiency and, and what truly transpired there. And Zach Wilson's accuracy was really poor again last week versus Detroit. The third quarter was ooh, miserable. 55% adjusted accuracy for the game. Had two turnover-worthy plays from a clean pocket with just no one even remotely close to him in terms of pressure. And you just look at Wilson's mechanics. They just leave a a lot to be desired and my understanding is the Jets at this point um are not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater is 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 my understanding from from above there and the focus is going to be all off season on on Zach Wilson's mechanics to the point where he's not going to have an off season in saying all that I think the matchup tonight is as good as you could hope for now the weather provides that wrinkle but there is at least a path for relative success offensively for the Jets and Zach Wilson because if you look at Jacksonville's defense even though they've made this run where they are certainly in playoff contention and you just look at those division odds swing when Ryan Tannehill went out for the season yesterday and now Jacksonville's the favorite to win that division but you're looking at a defense now that is as trending really really poorly despite the win streak and you have walker out again with his high ankle sprain and you just kind of look at uh the trending metrics right they were eighth the first five weeks in defensive efficiency the jaguars from week six onwards you're looking at defense 31 and schedule adjusted efficiency only the bears are worse than the jags and 
Jacksonville's tragically bad through the air. 32nd in schedule adjusted pass efficiency since week six as well. So Zach Wilson has an opportunity here, but it's really the same thing we've seen virtually every week. Like Zach Wilson can't seem to play within structure. And that's something we outlined months ago and, you know, talked about his release time. And again, against the Lions, the majority of Wilson's completions are off script. They're downfield. They're not within the offense. And it's just weird to watch because Wilson's completions last week had the highest rate of 10 plus yards. But few of them, again, like are, are within the script or within the confines of this offense. So I'm interested to see what the Jets game plan is, because you go back and watch that film as an offensive coordinator. Robert Salah is a, a head coach. And you're like, yeesh, like Wilson's inaccuracies and the refusal to play within structure and with this weather. And then you you read this quote from LaFleur where he's talking about restoring the run game. That's probably the path here for the Jets at least early and in Jacksonville isn't good against the run either but that's been an area where the Jets offense has has kind of dwindled a little bit you look at some of those splits now Bam Knight's been solid but since week eight where you know Elijah Vera Tucker goes down and and Brees Hall goes down uh, the Jets run game has basically gone from fringe top 10 in efficiency to to bottom third of the league and it very much meshes with Elijah Vera Tucker and Brees Hall going down so I don't know if it's efficient enough to rely on that even with Jacksonville's run defense woes I I think this is really interesting right this is just another one of those those games where I'm looking at the total and I'll just be be open and honest here like with no weather with everything playing normal like our our number's 42 9 on this game and so we were kind of hoping for this weather to clear out and and come back in over but the reality is like it just keeps getting worse and you know yesterday we saw a group come in and, and clearly their number doesn't doesn't mesh with with going under because you know we talked to them firsthand but they were going under 37 and a half um it's just for me it's 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 not a game that i have anything on at this point but we did see a little well, Jets money come in here quietly. Yeah, it's kind of leaked out. Very similar pattern to what we saw unfold last weekend against the Lions, where the public appears to be relatively split buying into some of the upstart team here, but the Jets taking money. Last week, they came up short on that fourth and inches that turned into a 51-yard touchdown pass that allowed the Lions to get to the window. We'll see how things play out here. And all the points you make on Zach Wilson, I mean, the numbers downright staggering inside the pocket last week 41 percent completions a passer rating under 50 were both were the worst of any quarterback for week 15 meanwhile outside the pocket much like we saw during his time at BYU playing against delivery drivers uh, and garbage men on the outside six of six 135 passing yards two touchdowns no picks and a perfect passer rating so you wonder how the Jets will try and scheme things up I still believe that I'd like to see Wilson use his legs a little more and if he can break contain take advantage of some of the things on the edge as long as he's smart enough to get down because he's not the big not the biggest guy out there and if he's going to take a pounding (laughs) from an NFL caliber defense things aren't going to bode well for him uh in his diminutive stature they did yeah LaFleur did use him I believe it was man it was either second quarter or third quarter they used him on some design runs around midfield in short yardage situations but he smartly ducked down because his stature just does not allow him to to carry the ball multiple times through traffic yeah I mean there is no doubt he is not built like Cam Newton he is not built like Jalen Hurts uh, so going out there and trying to go one-on-one with linebackers in open space will not be a recipe for success of course the other injury you're going to want to keep tabs on for the Jets on the defensive side of the ball Quinn and Williams was trending up throughout the course of the week obviously a key cog to generate a little bit of interior pressure against Trevor Lawrence getting him off his spot from one team that hails at MetLife Stadium to another but this one will be out on the road at U.S. Bank Stadium on Saturday it's the New York Giants against the Minnesota Vikings the Vikings now out to a four-point favorite pretty much painted across the board with a total of 48 as well when you look at these two teams they've combined for 18 yes 18 18 one score wins between them the best records in the league the Vikings 10 and 0 in those games the Giants 8 2 and 1 the Minnesota Vikings have already clinched the NFC North they're going to need significant help if they're going to get the one overall seed which I'm not even sure they can get to if I look at some of the tiebreakers uh planning an ice out though inside the building the Vikings will wear all white in this particular spot meanwhile the Giants a massive win on Sunday night football currently the sixth seed in the NFC standings can they clint can clinch a playoff berth excuse me with a win and losses by either the Lions Seahawks and Commanders only two of those teams to go down and that would mark the first 
playoff appearance since 2016, as the Giants are currently tied for the third longest active drought in the NFL. But Payne, when you look at this game, we know Daniel Jones has been good against the number when he goes out on the road. The Giants' offensive ceiling seems to be somewhat limited. We know the Vikings have firepower on the offensive side that's going to be able to move the football against this Giants' stop unit. But on the other side, what's the Giants' best path offensively if they're going to attack a Vikings defense that's trending in a very poor manner? So the the interesting thing to me is always the market and what it does. And I think we – was this a game that we spoke about on Monday? I'm nearly certain. But we referenced the Giants and the Vikings as being bet against teams. But apparently, the Giants are the larger bet against team this week. You you saw – very early, a little bit of a dummy money down to the key. And suddenly, once we got to Minnesota th- minus three, a, a wildly respected group came in late. At, that's why we're at four and a half now. You just wonder if the Giants exerted so much juice on Sunday night and the Vikings finally got their wake up call. And so you have this rest advantage late in the year, which really matters, as we discussed last week with that 200 plus sample size trend. I, I do have to say you can at least see the path for the Giants to have some offensive success if they do things right and when they've played defenses in this class they've had a a two in front of their name on the scoreboard and I think that's you know pretty vital here because the Giants defense is is one of the league's worst with the guys they have missing and so it's it's about their offense and I think you kind of led us perfectly here and, and mentioned that the Giants are, are better kind of in this role, right? The underdog role. It's it's mostly because Daniel Jones has is, is oddly played better on the road. If you look at his career splits, right? Passer rating about 11% better on the highway. His adjusted net yards per pass attempt, 1.2 yards better on the highway. His touchdown interception ratio is 3-1 to one on the road. It's virtually 1-1 one to one at home. So just Daniel Jones has been better on the road. And when you get better quarterback play, your team is going to perform better and that's that's basically the dumb down correlation to that success on the road but past that think about the matchup and some of the things that we've said about the Vikings defense over the last month because it feels like we've broken down Minnesota a bunch over that time but the Vikings the most sensitive defense to play action passes literally dead last in EPA per pass allowed to play action passes Daniel Jones throws with play action on 35% of his dropbacks, fifth highest rate in the league. I would expect that to be juiced up a little bit this week. It feels like the perfect game for the Giants to break some tendencies, right? They've become pretty run heavy on early downs, but suddenly you could see the path for for Dayball and Kafka to throw an early down specifically with play action. The Vikings are dead last defending early down passes. The Vikings defense, bottom five in the league situationally as well, whether that's red zone or third downs. And so you say, hey, maybe those will will revert to the mean a little bit. But you just look at how they're built, how they defend things structurally, and you don't really see a path for for great improvement in either of those areas. And then you look at the Vikings defense and how they've struggled to defend intermediate and deep passes. And, you know, the Vikings have been also one of the very worst teams defending running back passes. So this game needs to be honestly like the Giants just passing the ball more right passing early passing often you you kind of just get that vibe where you know we saw last week no lead is safe and you just go back even last year Todd like the Minnesota Vikings with Zimmer they would come out uber conservative but when they were forced to play from behind it was one of the most efficient passing offenses in the second half of games and again last week they just showed that firepower that you know when their backs against the wall like they're going to chuck, they're going to be efficient. And so the Giants can't really see themselves in a situation where they're just not being aggressive early, not staying aggressive throughout the course of this game. And, you know, kind of going back to, to what we discussed, right? It's like more passing on early downs, you know, using more play action, you know, rather than run on first down to Saquon up the gut for two yards, right? The, the better alternative is using him through the air. And Minnesota also bottom eight in the league in both receptions and yards to running backs. So I think that's ultimately the path for the Giants having offensive success here. They're stepping down in class, certainly from the last few games where you're talking Washington, Philadelphia, Washington in a in a three game span. And I just think the Giants will be a little bit more aggressive in this spot. And because I don't see Wink's defense getting many stops either, unless it's, they're finding ways to get pressure on Kirk. Um, I, I think there'd probably be some points in this game. You saw Wink take a shot at Kevin O'Connor 
McConnell. And yes, he said it jokingly, but I wouldn't have received it as such. And I certainly would be looking to to pile on as many points because of that. And you look at the Giants kind of they also have a horrific early down defense. And that's that's very much the reason, right? The look ahead total here was 45 and a half. And we're now out to as high as 48 and a half with this consensus of 48. Yeah, pretty wild. I mean, when you look at the Giants and some of the playmakers or lack thereof, I mean, we know this team has an offensive ceiling most weeks, but you're going to have to be more aggressive to get the likes of a Richie James, Darius Slayton and Isaiah Hodgins involved. Saquon Barkley, no doubt a difference maker. And you saw the X factor that he can, he can become with three straight carries when they were running their four-minute offense late in that game, picking up 10-plus yards, showed his value as a receiver as well, uh, and a little bit of an underrated skill set to further highlight some of the trials and tribulations that Minnesota's experienced on the defensive side. If you're just looking at the counting stats that are out there, they're almost dead last in passing attempts, yards, average yards allowed, uh, 19th in efficiency, allowing more than 31 points per game the past six games. It's worse than the NFL. They're 28th on the season, allowing more than 24 points per contest, allowing nearly 400 yards per game dead last in the NFL. And a run defense that was perceived to be the strength, at least early in the year, has been absolutely gashed, giving up 120 plus on the ground. The only exception coming on Thanksgiving against New England, where they completely bottled up the Patriots. So a lot of pathways for success if the Giants choose to be aggressive, and yeah. they're going to need to, to your points, because Minnesota is going to get theirs after the wake-up call they experienced against the Colts. From a and that's that's the motivation, right? Like you might be thinking to yourself like, hey, you know, we got to keep things conservative for Daniel Jones. But we watched the the successful game plan unfold right in front of our eyes on Thanksgiving Day. And it's Mac Jones, who has been horrific the last two weeks, just going up and down the field, slicing and dicing this Minnesota defense. And so I think it's it's an easy strategy to to really catch the Vikings off guard here and just just attack through the well, air. Also, this quote, did you see the quote? I referenced it, but I wasn't quite sure of what the quote was, so I didn't want to butcher it. But Wink Martindale is saying, I'm a blue collar guy. Kevin O'Connell is is Harry Styles. So uh, those are fighting words. I'm going to run up some points on Wink if I have the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, Kevin O'Connell, hell of a lot look better looking dude than Wink Martindale at their respective points in their life. So, I mean, blue collar or otherwise, you can go off of pure aesthetics in that particular regard. But no doubt uh, we could see uh, an interesting game on display in a game unlike the rest of the slate that shouldn't be marred by the elements uh, unless there's a problem with the roof at U.S. Bank Stadium. But you mentioned Mac Jones, Payne, and the New England Patriots will return home with their playoff hopes hanging in the balance. Some books have them as much as a 4-1 to one underdog to secure passage to the postseason in the wake of their loss to the Raiders. They find themselves a field goal underdog as the Cincinnati Bengals come to town. Total on the game, 41 and a half. We mentioned weather off the top playing a role in Thursday night's game between the Jets and Jaguars. Weather should play a role in Foxborough as well. Temperatures that are going to feel like it could be in the low teens. Wind gusts, 40% chance of precipitation. The Bengals have altered their travel plans as a result. Uh, going to leave Thursday to try and beat the weather. No better way than to spend an extra day in Foxborough where there's nothing around that particular area. When you look at Joe Burrow and some of the coldest starts in his career, uh, happened last year in the playoffs against the Raiders and in 2022 against the Steelers. He's been outstanding in the elements like you'd expect with a pedigree quarterback. 5-0 and with a passer rating just shy of 120 uh, and you're talking about a quarterback that knows his strengths and weaknesses as you try and look at this New England Patriots team pain obviously there's a lot of carnage there's a lot of collateral damage you've seen some of the Patriot blue bloods including Ty Law and Julian Edelman calling out the team whether it's individual players whether it's the coaching staff the best way to erase what we saw unfold in my backyard last Sunday is with a dominant or at least a complete performance against the team that has an outside shot to be the number one seed in the AFC. If the Patriots are going to have success against the Bengals here, we saw the Bengals get themselves behind the eight ball against the Bucks. The Bucks gift wrapped the game. They were able to come storing back. But New England, no stranger to slow starts in their own right, looking to run the football and more or less handcuffing Mac Jones in his ability to stretch the defense. Yeah, this one's there's just so many interesting things about this game and moving parts and you hit on the one with the the abbreviated travel schedule and you know during monday's look ahead line segment this was a game we talked about and we just said hey patriots plus four wouldn't last and regardless of what result transpires this week nobody important was was getting to Bengals minus four in new england here so so that's why we're down to three but 
you know, we're 15 weeks into the season. I just have no clue what New England is. Just flat out disarray. And to your point, that's the reason why past Patriots who are wildly respected are coming out on social media and displaying their disdain for what's transpiring in New England right now. I mean, Belichick's ego and, you know, his hubris is the reason a bad defensive coordinator is now a horrific offensive coordinator. And New England special teams having some blunders that we just don't typically see from a buttoned up Belichick team. And you're watching some of the smartest guys on the team implode late with Jacoby Myers, who by all accounts is literally like one of the sharpest guys in that entire locker room, just having a brain fart late. And then you spent two weeks on the West coast and now you're returning home Christmas week and you had your guts ripped out against the Raiders. And now all of a sudden you have a 19% chance to make the playoffs. Like what's the vibe here, right? Like Mac Jones is still yelling at coaches. Belichick's taking shots at his quarterback and the, in his pressers publicly saying that was like brutal, by the way throw the ball 55 yards on a Hail Mary <laughs> right so like what's the vibe here like I just I don't know what's going on and so even when Belichick was asked about Mac Jones starting this week he said something to the effect of the plan is to try and beat Cincinnati all right just weird things in in New England right now you, you thought Mac had kind of turned the corner because you look right completed 85 percent of his passes against the tough Jets defense looked like a cool million uh on Thanksgiving Day against Minnesota which we just talked about so that should have been the jumping off point to catapult things the last two weeks against a poor Cardinals pass defense and then you get the 31st ranked Raiders defense and instead it's it's Mac Jones being th- QB 32 out of 36 the last two weeks an EPA plus completion percentage over expectation against those defenses. Now, the matchup is is interesting here because if you look at the Bengals defense, they're substantially better against the run, especially when you look at metrics with only DJ Reader on the field where the Bengals go from average to top 10 and New England wants to be able to run it. I don't know if you're going to be able to. Let's see. If New England's going to stand a chance in this game, though, they have to get out much better, something we referenced again on Monday. And and to this point, Matt Patricia hasn't shown an ability to scheme, script, or be aggressive early. But your best chance is to score on Cincinnati is, is very much in the first half before Lou Anarumo makes his adjustments. And, you know, we, we keep giving Lou a bunch of credit, but it just keeps bearing fruit in terms of the adjustments that he's making. You could see it, right? I mean, it's just you see it with your eyes. You see it in something, you know, on the scoreboard and then you dig into the metrics like Cincinnati this season 24th in EPA per play in the first half sixth in the second half so you have to be able to get points early on the Bengals and the Patriots just haven't shown a willingness to be aggressive or very bright early in these games and that has to change for them to have a chance here part of this move towards New England Todd right some injuries to kind of monitor on the Bengals defense we know Awuzie is out for the season Eli Apple found himself on the injury report with an ankle Trey Hendrickson has the broken wrist missed last week and now Sam Hubbard has missed back-to-back practices with a calf injury which we know those calf injuries can be a little bit wonky and he's one of the best run setting edges this league has so maybe if he's out and Hendrickson doesn't play maybe there is a path to be able to, to run the ball here maybe there is a path to be able to throw comfortably without a ton of pressure and so those are the reasons that that we've seen the Patriots take money I just haven't been able to join that party yet. I'm not sure about No, you, uh, I haven't either. Uh, I know we texted a little bit about this game. You said there was no chance it was going to creep through four. Obviously, we saw the resistance uh, that you kind of highlighted, anticipating it hitting the market. Uh, I was surprised it happened uh, as early as it did, knowing that public perception probably had the Patriots stock at the bottom of the market. We know some groups want to make sure if they have a point of value, especially around a key, they lock that up rather than hoping there was a four and a half or something else popped. We know it's going to be tough from a book standpoint to try and get recreation betters to the window on New England, knowing the lasting image we saw of them was a team that's kind of dealing with some of that infighting that's out there. You talked about the Sam Hubbard injury, which I think is absolutely massive. Uh, I'm going to work under the assumption that we may not see Sam Hubbard uh, again until the postseason with that calf injury for the Bengals. But of course, a massive game for Cincinnati as well, coming up a week from Monday against the Buffalo Bills. We'll see how the Bengals hold up with back-to-back games on the road. The one thing that's always been challenging for me when it comes to the Patriots, and I don't want to spend obviously much time there, is figuring out what this team is on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, I know metrically defensive efficiency from some of the more prominent sites out there hold them in a very high regard, but I watch them week in, week out, and 
I guess underwhelmed would probably be the best adjective I could use to describe them. But we saw the Bucks at least confuse and make life difficult for Joe Burrow last week in the first half. It wasn't until the Bengals were able to create some short fields uh, and be able to maximize their opportunities out there. I mean, we can't ignore the fact that in that victory where the Bucks did cover as a three and a half point road favorite, they didn't even amass 250 total yards of offense. And what goes up must come down. I'm very curious to see what New England can do to make life a little bit more difficult for Joe Burrow, who's making a dark horse run at potentially being the league's MVP. You can follow... Not a chance. No, I was going to say, I mean, I don't think, <laughs> no, I don't I think he gets there, I, but I think when you look at, yeah. you know, if there's no Patrick Mahomes or a healthy Jalen Hurts in the mix, Joe Burrow has quietly done more uh, than I think he's being given credit for. A lot of people are still haunted by that multiple interception performance they saw week one when he was coming back from an appendectomy. Uh, but you were the first one to highlight it. Once the Bengals yeah. made that adjustment offensively, allowed Burrow to take more control, both run and throw out of the shotgun, it's truly paid dividends. We know the weapons that are around there, uh, and it's it's a team that you highlighted you a few go. weeks ago. Said 20-1 <laughs> to 1 on the market. Wasn't going to be there long. Uh, and obviously, the Bengals uh, have gone out there and exceeded expectations to the tune of 18-3 and three against the spread their last 21 games. You can f- So two sure. things there, right? I, I, th- I think ultimately, you give Burrow all the credit in the world. I think he's a very good quarterback. I don't know if... He's got one of the best receiving groups. Oh, for sure. His weapons are unrivaled anywhere in the league. They spend spend $100 million up front this year in in offensive linemen. You have two very good running backs. Um, So, yes, he's been playing substantially better. I think to your point, though, it's something we've talked about with New England's defense. They don't look like the second best defense in the league, and that's where they are at in schedule adjusted efficiency. And I think why that is and this is just my my viewpoint you see a team that has one pro bowler and so their success is very much scheme driven and so when that scheme in those one data point settings get figured out it suddenly does not look like a defense remotely close to being number two and I think that's ultimately what you kind of have to figure out in some of these matchups right because they don't have the talent to be a number two defense, but they scheme so well. But when that scheme goes by the wayside, they look horrific. And that's the question, like, this is the first time Joe Burrow is facing Belichick's defense, which typically the data would suggest slight tick up for Belichick in some of these situations. But Burrow is certainly a different beast, and the components within the Cincinnati offense are are far better than some of the first-time quarterbacks that uh, Belichick's played. Yeah, I mean, uh, to your point, I mean, Matthew Judon, the only guy getting those postseason accolades, it's been him and Josh Uche coming off the edge. Uh, But when some of those defensive backs have been left in coverage, the recipe hasn't exactly been great, and the result's nothing to write home about by any stretch of the imagination. You can follow Payne on Twitter, at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You, of course, can follow me there as well. Most importantly, as always, follow the podcast at bet the board pod and from the east coast to the west coast pain when you're looking at the washington commanders a little bit of a short week playing sunday night football now traveling out to the bay area to meet the hottest team in the national football league which would be the 49ers san francisco a blanket seven point favorite in this game total sits at 37 and a half that's down a touch from a true peak of 41 and a half but we'll call 39 and a half more or less the market consensus out here in the desert when that number opened when you're looking at the playoff scenarios in play here the commanders currently the seventh seed in the nfc a half game ahead of both the Seattle Seahawks and the Detroit Lions. The 49ers comfortably entrench as the current three seed in the NFC. They did clinch the NFC West last week. They're one game behind the number two Vikings. These are two of the top four scoring defenses since week eight. Tops in time of possession. The commanders, the highest average time of possession that's obviously correlated to their success, holding the football for nearly 33 minutes a game. The 49ers second in that department. And a battle of quarterbacks who I think when they were coming out in their respective draft classes never anticipated being here. Taylor Haneke was undrafted. We know the story of Brock Purdy all too well. Crazy when you look at Purdy. He went from uh, an afterthought, even in 49 Niners camp to now I believe the fourth favorite for the offensive rookie of the year with a very limited sample size when you look at Washington's full body of work they've been an under team all season long 10 and 2 to the under the past 12 games an average points scored in those contests of 35 
and change. Meanwhile, the 49ers during their seven game winning streak have exceeded odds makers expectations going six and one against the spread during that span. But Payne, for all the good things that we can say about Washington's defense, and obviously that taking some of the burden off of the offense, uh, even behind Brian Robinson asserting himself as RB1, their defense showed a little bit of frailty last week against the New York Giants. As you begin to assess the 49ers as they're currently constructed, we know there won't be any Debo Samuel out there. Kyle Shanahan with some interesting comments about when he might look to rest players and do some unique things there to make sure that his team is ready for the playoffs, something, a luxury they haven't been afforded, needing to secure the division each of the last two seasons, the final week of the regular season. How should the 49ers go about attacking this Washington defense, whether or not Chase Young makes his season debut? So I think you're kind of hinting at some things there, and those sentiments from Kyle Shanahan were certainly received, and market indicators are suggesting the commanders can keep this close enough because within the last 36 hours since those quotes from Kyle have come out we've we've gone from 49ers minus 7.7 to 49ers minus 6.8 here and when you're trying to figure out a path for Washington being the side it's mostly about the commander's defense with the correlation of under coming in it's it's not necessarily about Taylor Heineke one of the worst quarterbacks in the league in Washington's offense because the path to points isn't necessarily there for the commander's offense and so this is very much about Washington's defense muddying this game up, stopping the run, applying pressure to Brock Purdy literally and then figuratively by putting the game in his hands. And, you know, Brock Purdy's stepping up in class here. You know, he played a below average Dolphins defense, played a bottom eight defense in Seattle, did play a Buccaneers defense that's top 10, but a lot of their key cogs were out on that side of the ball. And so this, to me, when you think about defense when you think about health this is the toughest defense that Brock Purdy's had to play to date and the commanders have shown an ability to stop the run now last week the Giants hit them with some heavier formation stuff and really it was the late runs that became efficient for Saquon Barkley basically just became the compilation of physicality a lot of the runs were not very efficient it was just the sheer number and volume um, that kind of reared its head late there for the Giants to have success on the ground. But all told, Washington's still top five in schedule adjusted rush efficiency on the defensive side of the ball. That's the key against a Shanahan led offense that operates with a pass rate over expectation at a bottom 10 rate. They want to run the ball. And if you look at Brock Purdy right now, he's not pushing the ball downfield. Both his air yards and target depth are roughly five and a half yards. So you're just not getting him to be overly explosive and so if you're not pushing the ball and you're not hitting those explosives because of it it correlates to less variance and so I don't really know and this is kind of something we touched on last week and you know without Debo Samuel Ayuk being on the outside and not necessarily the the best route runner or space creator you saw them have to really rely on Kittle And so there's not a ton of, it sounds crazy to say this, there's not a ton of like weapons that are going to kill you down the field here. And it also looks like the commanders are getting their best cover cornerback in Benjamin St. Juice. He says he's playing this week. He missed last week. And so I think that really helps the commanders defensively here. If you look at that pass defense of Washington with St. Juice on the field versus off the field, like it's 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 dramatic. So that would be a good get back. He says he's playing. So that's really the component here for Washington. Like this has to be a game that they muddy up and it falls something right like 20 to 14, 17, 13, 17, 14. Like that's that's the correlation here if Washington's the side. And you've seen games with this 49ers offense, even with Christian McCaffrey, where they haven't looked to be that explosive. Now, I know it came with Jimmy Garoppolo, but the game that stands out is the 13-0 win they had at home against the Saints. You wonder with San Francisco, they can say what they want about hoping that the chips fall the right way. They can work themselves into a slightly higher seed. But at the same time, I mean, there should be that collective sigh of relief throughout the Bay Area that 
that the division is wrapped up, a Washington team that might be a little bit more desperate. And to your point, a significant step up in class for Brock Purdy against a defense that now actually has tape on a quarterback not willing or obviously by design to push the ball down the field when you're looking at all of that. And what I took away from some of Kyle Shanahan's comments, and again, it's my own reading, not necessarily having insight into their game plan. When you're talking about resting players trying to keep them fresh, do you want to give Christian McCaffrey a full workload in these kind of spots, or do you see a little bit more of a timeshare between him and Jordan Mason, knowing that McCaffrey's value, especially against the commander's defense that struggled to slow down opposing running backs catching the ball, could be as much as a receiver, more so than as a runner between the tackles. So a lot of interesting components there, for sure. It's just... It's just kind of like trying to stack the deck in your favor now. Like, I haven't personally gotten to the window on the commanders, saw it come in, know who it's from. It's 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 quite sharp at seven and a half. And so, you know, you're kind of just, you know, one team is certainly more desperate than the other. And you're kind of hinting at the 49ers, maybe whether it's resting guys completely or decreasing their workload and so that's that's part of this but you also like reference the data point where san francisco at times have kind of just kind of gone through the motions we saw it early on against the chargers we saw it to your point against the saints and you're looking for like the peak data point where a commander's team has gone on the road and played a team in this class and and played quite well in philadelphia right so you you have some of those data points to where you could kind of see the path here Yep. And that's the whole thing. I mean, we talk all the time about low totals and the value of a number this large. You talked about muddying it up. And I think it's the perfect way to kind of look at a game like this that, you know, what is the magic number for either Washington to achieve or the 49ers to achieve if they're going to cover? or if the commanders become the side. So an interesting game for a variety of reasons. I think oftentimes people are left left with a lasting visual of Washington struggling against the Giants 20-12. to They know about how well the 49ers are playing. The narrative and all of that can often create a little bit of value in the betting market. Well, Washington travels west. Two of their familiar foes within the division will do battle in Big D. And the murky picture here got a little bit clearer earlier this morning as news officially broke that Nick Sirianni said Jalen Hurts will most likely be unavailable to play this weekend against the (laughs) Dallas Cowboys. Something the betting market told us Monday morning when that number went from one and a half to two and a half to three to four to five to six and topping out at six and a half. We've now settled in with the Dallas Cowboys, a six. Six point favorite total on the game, 46 and a half. First time all year that the Philadelphia Eagles will actually be listed as an underdog. The third regular season meeting where both of these teams, the Cowboys and Eagles, will enter with 10 plus wins. The Cowboys won the previous two games, which happened back in 1980 and 2009. What's at stake here? The Eagles can clinch the NFC East and home field advantage through the NFC playoffs with a win. The Eagles' next win will mean there's been no repeat NFC East champion in 18 straight seasons since the Eagles did it back in 2004, extending the longest run by any division since the 1970 NFL-AFL merger. We know the Cowboys, despite losing last week against Jacksonville, did clinch their playoff berth. And you talk about trying to replace a level of productivity in Jalen Hurts. Payne, I'm amazed how many people uh, in the last 48 to 72 hours are talking about how it won't be that big a drop-off. Gardner Minshew has starting experience uh, and is more than capable of taking over the Eagles' offense. It leads me to believe they're selling Jalen Hurts short and some of his ongoing development, not just as a runner, but a passer this year, knowing he's got such dynamic weapons in the likes of Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown that were putting up Pro Bowl type numbers. And for the Eagles, their offense will get at least a shot in the arm here. We'll see exactly how he's integrated back into the fold with Dallas Goddard being upgraded to the active roster. Not a fan of the stash. I mean, he's good, but to say he's Jalen Hurts and the offense won't experience a drop-off is downright nonsense, in my opinion. (laughs) We managed to talk about this in passing and get the podcast out for consumption on Monday hours before the news actually broke. And we, we kind of mentioned like Gardner Minshew being one of the best backup quarterbacks in this league. And that's why we talk about value all the time and the drop off from Hertz to Minshew, not nearly as large as, as Mahomes to Henny. Now this is a, a horrific spot for the Eagles, right? They're, they're almost playing for, for not a year. Dallas is playing for virtually everything, and this is the Eagles' third straight road game late in the season, and so some some negative trends against that. 
However, with Minshew, he started two games last season. I think we backed him in one. Was fantastic on the road against the Jets. Did play Week 18 against this very Cowboys defense led by by Dan Quinn. And so you kind of might want to use that data point. And on the surface, you might be okay. But I wouldn't do that. And I understand that that matchup didn't go very well, right? Like Minshew had a 51 QBR. He finished the week quarterback 26 out of 33 in EPA plus completion percentage over expectation. But I think you do have to put Minshew's performance against the Cowboys last season in the right context. And the right context for me is like understanding the Eagles were down four starting offensive linemen and three of the Eagles top four weapons this season didn't play or weren't on the roster in last season's week 18 matchup with AJ Brown and Miles Sanders and Dallas Goddard all not on the field for that and then you kind of compound that with what's unfolding here with this Cowboys defense and it's you know Micah Parsons not practicing yet this week because he's dealing with an illness I would assume he's going to be fine come come Saturday Dorrance Armstrong who is you know second on the team in sacks was on the injury report last week battled through it and played in the Jaguars game and then left with that with that same injury in that game and he's been limited all week so let's see how that unfolds and Leighton Vander Esch well he's certainly been I would say had a disappointing career relative to where he was drafted still a starter in your front seven and he's down with a neck injury hasn't practiced yet and from the Cowboys ideal defense the one that they would want to put out there if they could handpick their guys there are seven starters that are either out or have a questionable designation this week and you know I think what you're seeing and this was one of the reasons we bet Jacksonville last week over the last month right since since week 12 basically this you know vaunted Cowboys defense 19th and overall schedule adjust efficiency. The injuries in the secondary have been exposed by quarterbacks like Daniel Jones and Matt Ryan, who was just benched for the second time in the same season, and Davis Mills, who was also benched this season, and then Trevor Lawrence, obviously, and receivers like Chris Moore and Alec Pierce and Jay Jones are just going ham out there against this team. Don't, don't you so, cast dispersions I, at Zay Jones? Don't you take shots I'm at our not. guy, what he did getting us back into contention with the outright win last week as a best bet? Uh, you know, Anthony Brown and, and Jordan Lewis are out. And, you know, J. Ron Curse is playing at far less than 100%. And the Cowboys were always a little soft in the middle of their interior of the defensive line. And so that was one area you could attack. And now it seems like there's two holes. And so this is the reason for the the defensive regression for, for the Cowboys. But from this moment forward, I think this becomes all about price, right? Nothing more. If you got out ahead on of the Jalen Hurts news and laid one or an affordable money line, like kudos, right? But we've seen initial nibbles on the Eagles at six, which forced this to dip back down to five and as low as four and a half at one spot. And then all of a sudden, as we were recording, you know, Jalen Hurts is officially – out and that hits the screen and now we're back to like 6.1 some places and so my feeling is like at some point you'll probably see a little eagles money come in whether it's in the buyback variety on middle attempts from those that have dallas money line or betters that were simply waiting to value bet the eagles at a peak price because they don't see the massive drop off from Jalen Hurts to Gardner Minshew. We know it is one, right? But this was roughly a pick'em game, and we're now at six. Is the drop off six points in numerical value and substantially more when you're talking about going through the four and the three? And I don't know when you put those numbers together and say, "Hey, that's like you know, truly six point seven five points of value." Like. I don't know if Jalen Hurts is worth that. And so you're going to have that faction of better probably value betting the Eagles. And I think what's interesting here is we're saying in a narrative based manner, right? The game doesn't really mean as much to the Eagles. It means more to Dallas and and true on the surface. But the idea of a guy like Dallas Goddard coming back this week 
he could come back next week if the game wasn't meaningful. It kind of signals that maybe the Eagles aren't laying down. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that the Eagles just go in there against a division rival and go, ah, we're just going to go through the motions uh, and give you a chance to run roughshod over us. Uh, at the same time, we've seen the Cowboys. It won't be the first time that they have to respond against a tough opponent after a heartbreaking overtime loss. I mean, week 10, they saw a 14-point lead evaporate on the field at Lambeau against the Packers. They followed up with a 40-3 to smashing uh, of the Vikings on the road in week 11. So I think this is as much for the Cowboys to prove to themselves uh, as much as anything else. When you look at the other side of the ball and try and figure out a path to success for the Cowboys, the Boo Birds are out in full force as Dak Prescott has struggled with interceptions. He does have a good record in his career, 6-1 and one straight up in ATS and his seven start last seven starts against the Eagles. 148 passer rating versus the Eagles last season is the third highest rate by any quarterback versus any team in a single season all time. It does, of course, come with the caveat that you highlighted the regular season finale. It looked like the Cowboys were playing against second second and third stringers is that Philadelphia Eagles were trying to stay healthy. But for everything that Philadelphia has done to try and fortify some of their weaknesses against the run along that defensive line, Dallas should have a little bit of an edge here with the two-headed monster with Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott. If you're the Cowboys trying to devise a game plan, throwing outside, probably not an option against Darius Slay uh, and... Bradford for what those guys can do yep. but you should be able to at least take some shots in the middle of the field run the football and be able to move the football yeah I mean you know the loyal listeners are gonna understand the breakdown they've heard the breakdown it's 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 somewhat you know forward I mean this is this that's the plan right there right and, and when you think about quality of defense one of the very best halves of football the Cowboys offense has played this season was actually back in week six in the second half against the Eagles, and that was with a backup quarterback. I mean, 63% of the Cowboys' second half runs against Philly graded successful, and you saw what Dallas did. They came out in their three wide sets. They spread the field. They used stack formations. They used you know three-by-one sets to lighten the box, and the Cowboys' run game suddenly unlocked, and guys in the Eagles' secondary couldn't tackle Pollard and didn't want to tackle Zeke, and that was basically how the Cowboys fired up their ground game. Now, Terrence Steele went down with an injury along the Cowboys' offensive line. It's a big loss, but Tyron Smith returned last week, got his feet wet, took a ton of snaps, He's going to be right in the fold this week. Jason Peters has played some really nice snaps from week 7 to 14. It just feels like that guy is meant to play football until he's put in the grave. Uh, Zach Martin is is just still a damn beast. The light has come on for Tyler Smith. If you look at his last three games, they're his best three games that he's played this season. So the offensive line feels like it's still in a pretty good spot for the Cowboys despite the loss of Terrence Steele. The Achilles heel, to your point, is, has been the Eagles' run defense all season. 20th in schedule adjusted rush efficiency. They did get Jordan Davis back healthy. They appeared to turn the corner against the Titans, but we kind of just come to understand that the Titans' run game isn't very good right now, whether it's a beaten and battered Titans offensive line or you know Derrick Henry dealing with a little bit of a foot issue, whatever the case may be be it that might not have been you know all on the eagles accord there um jordan davis has only played 35 snaps the last three weeks sue and linville joseph have provided some beef but neither playing overly well and fletcher cox I mean, eagles fans don't want to hear this but he's basically a shell of his former self just too many snaps too many wars on the inside he's just completely worn down there graded out as one of the worst interior defensive linemen this season so we'll see if all of this beef that's kind of been added to the interior provides the necessary resistance. And I think Dallas will smartly go to some of these spread formations and force the Eagles to play a little bit lighter. We'll see if they bite. Um, if they don't, right, then you got to then you got to be able to pass the ball quick and short here before pressure gets gets there. Now, uh, we also talk about exploring the underneath pass game when you face Philadelphia. Dallas needs to do more of that, right? You have to get Schultz more involved. Pollard needs to be an integral role in the pass game. Pushing the ball downfield, specifically to the outside, to your point, is is not the best approach against Philly. And, you know, we've talked about that ad nauseum, right? Because if you look at the Eagles, every single pass they've defended this season, it's, you know, number two in defensive schedule adjusted pass efficiency. But if you just kind of focus on those throws in that one to seven yard area, the defense dramatically dips for Philadelphia. It's basically a byproduct of the scheme where they play to keep things in front, but you can have success with those short, intermediate, underneath throws. If you look at C.D. Lamb, he's got to be that guy on crossers and digs and, you know, getting him underneath. He's got to be able to dominate the slot. That's really 
where the Eagles give up most of their wide receiver production is in the slot and on the short passes. And so that's kind of the path here for Dallas's offense. It's being the more physical team, running the ball right at Philadelphia, hitting those edges, getting them in those light light box situations by spreading them out. And then, you know, Dak having some success throwing underneath and into the slot. You know, you mentioned the numerical drop-off potentially being overblown from Jalen Hurts to Gardner Minshew. We look at Minshew's numbers, uh, albeit through a limited sample size. They're not bad by backup quarterback standards at at all. As far as the total, were you surprised to see this total dip as far as it has from 51 down to 46 and a half with the change of quarterback? Well, we were at 51 and a half before the news started to leak. Okay. And man, I'm probably divulging again way too much. Well, you can stop. You can my, stop yourself my, here then. My yeah, my number was was call it 49. And you know, if I looked at some some trending data, right, and reran things, which we which we always do, it was a touch higher, it was a 51. So I understood why bookmakers opened it there. And then we were at 47 and a half this morning. And then when the obvious hit the screen, we've now gone under the key of 47 and you're at 46 and a half and some of the sharper spots, even 46. I just think it'll be interesting if if the Cowboys decide to go a little bit lower variance and we're going to run the ball and we're going to throw short, right? Those things eat the clock a little bit. I'm not quite sure what Philadelphia has in store for their offense in terms of, hey, do we want to up the tempo rate? Do we want to push the ball downfield like immediately as the game plan and attack that weakness for the Cowboys secondary? We're going to come in a little bit more conservative to see what what's going on. I, I don't really have my my finger on the pulse of what the plan is for the Eagles no, offense. It makes a ton so of sense. And that's more difficult. Yeah, it's me. kind of why yeah. I just like to ask some of those questions for you. I mean, when you look at obviously we always talk about what a quarterback's value is to the overall point spread. I think the total becomes a little bit more of that black box that you try and anticipate what the game flow will be, how some of the focus will change and pace tempo and a lot of the different variables that play an even bigger role in trying to assess the totals market more so than the sides. The final game we have on the schedule, and I know a lot of our listeners out there going, man, you guys haven't even touched on any of the Sunday games. We're not sure how you feel about Monday night. We wanted to highlight some of the biggest matchups for the weekend. So no deep dives for any of the Sunday games for us here. And spoiler alert, no podcast scheduled for Monday. Uh, As we know, it's the late observance of the Christmas holiday and everything else. So we'll be back with you next Thursday. But the Saturday night affair is at a Crisier Field in Pittsburgh, where it's the Steelers short home favorites in that two, two and a half range as they'll welcome in the Raiders. It's the 50th anniversary of the Immaculate Reception. Obviously, the Steelers had a tribute plan to Franco Harris, who unfortunately passed away earlier this week. So you imagine it'll be a little bit of an amped up atmosphere there. Total on this game, 38 and a half. And when you look at the weather report for the Steel City, high projected in the teens winds of 20 to 30 mile an hour and the Steelers have not played a home game with kickoff temperatures below 10 degrees since 1989 so it'll be interesting to keep tabs on the mercury there and exactly what kind of fate mother nature deals to the game planning there when you look at the Steelers obviously they're still trying to avoid their first losing season since 2003 Um, When you talk about history here, I mean, J.J. Watt came out and said the fact that they're wearing the same jerseys as they did in the 1970s, it'll be an emotionally charged atmosphere there. The Raiders enter this game pain fresh off the 30-24 win against the New England Patriots as a two and a half point home favorite covered the closing number. We know how that storyline ended. Meanwhile, the Steelers on the other side with Mitchell Trubisky at the helm ran early, ran often and put together a marathon march, which basically zapped the spirits of the Carolina. Carolina Panthers to start that second half and you've seen the black and gold kind of return to their true and DNA running the football that may be a little bit different with Kenny Pickett being upgraded having cleared concussion protocol so we'll see what Mike Tomlin and Matt Canada elect to do when they're going after a Raiders defense but when you look at the handicap for this uh, I'm not sure which matchup you find more intriguing is it the Steelers offense with Pickett back at the helm against the Raiders defense that's shown vulnerabilities this year or is it more about Derek Carr playing in the elements uh trying to attack a Steelers defense it's really been hit or miss since the return of TJ Watt yeah I mean those are those are all great questions I I I think you know when you look at this game it's in the week in general and we talked about it at the top it's just been very weird in that a lot of the largest positions taken have been weather related the the handicaps have been very much weather related injury related and that's really the the spot you hinted at and in the place to start here and it's Kenny Pickett you know he's hopefully the the, the Steelers future 
but he hasn't shown to be better than Trubisky right this second. And if you look at the last two weeks combined, and you can get the idea of Mitch Trubisky out of your mind from his Chicago playing days, Trubisky's taken virtually every snap the last two weeks, and even factoring in the turnovers against Baltimore. Mitch is QB number one in EPA plus completion percentage over expectation, and candidly, it it hasn't been close. And so one faction of betters understand this. And because odds makers manually moved Pittsburgh from minus two and a half to basically 3.3 on the news of Pickett being upgraded and sophisticated betters quickly responded, sending it back to two and a half and even two. They just grasp that, you know, Pickett might not be a better quarterback at this point. And so ultimately there's there's going to be a battle on this game right did did you number grab the Raiders plus three and a half or or three even and you know you kind of believe that Darren Waller and Hunter Renfro snap counts are both going to increase this week because they're a little bit limited last week and so that's kind of the mindset if you're you're looking at the Raiders or are you going to capitalize on that number grab and take your position on the Steelers money line now that it's become wildly more affordable. Those are basically the two paths that have been taken to this point or will be taken from the guys that I speak with. Now, I think matchup wise, Pittsburgh's offense, you have to like how it's trending. You know, it's done some very nice things since they're by eighth in EPA per play since week 10. It was 28th prior to the bye. And you kind of, I think at some point in this podcast, mentioned the Steelers' ability to run the ball, and that's spot on, right? They've increased by 10% in success rate over the two periods of of pre- and post-bye. And we know the Raiders are one of the very worst defenses defending the Bass, 31st in schedule, just pass defense, but they're also bottom third of the league in defending the run as well. So there are some paths here for the, the Steelers offense. And now you have some of the outside factors that you've mentioned at the top, right? Freezing cold temps for a dome team, horrific Derek Carr metrics and frigid temps, both Mike Tomlin and Brian Flores being wildly familiar with Josh McDaniel's system, whether it's Flores playing McDaniels directly as as a member of the Dolphins or past matchups against Tomlin and McDaniels. And you have a couple linemen for the Raiders a little bit dinged up, although they did return to practice. They did so in a limited fashion, so they have to keep our eyes peeled on that. And you have a Steelers defense since they're by that are second in schedule adjusted rush efficiency. So if you can remove Jacobs from this game, the path becomes basically Devontae Adams and that's it and so you can see both viewpoints here I've yet to do anything but Todd no you have a little bit of a stronger feeling on this one yeah I mean I look before then move when we were working under the potential assumption that Trubisky was there I mean I did grab a very 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 small piece of the Steelers money line obviously still readily available so I wasn't exactly doing it with the foresight of grabbing the three and a half not thinking that the market was going to move there Uh, I just think it's an interesting game for a variety variety of factors. I mean, the Raiders are a team that, you know, on their best day has shown an ability to play with just about everybody. And they've been a much better team over the last five to seven games. Uh, I wonder about their ability to be buttoned up and can they handle a little bit of prosperity uh, in the wake of that improbable performance. Uh, But, you know, you you almost wonder in this particular matchup, you know, who becomes the toughest Smurf in terms of making adjustments in game because the Raiders did what they've done every single week or so (laughs) it seems play one good half of football early, do nothing in the second half and allow the defense to live in their backside. They, of course, get bailed out with that late drive and touchdown pass, whether it was or wasn't to Keelan Cole. And of course, the brain cramp from Ramondre Stevenson and and Jacoby Meyer. So I think it's an interesting game. Two teams that obviously aren't going to be involved in the postseason that want to see a a little bit of growth and prosperity, maybe more so on the Pittsburgh Steelers side for the reasons that you outlined, talking about Kenny Pickett, wanting to see some of that progression, knowing that numbers wise, I mean, Mitchell Trubisky, despite being the the bane of everyone's existence that wears Steelers colors because of those interceptions the metrics don't lie and he's actually been significantly better than people want to give him credit for so an interesting game Saturday night for sure that I'm sure a lot of people will be locked into when they're spending quality time with their family so uh, I'm curious to see where this number goes now that we're below the key of three if it gets back to three or if it continues to trend closer to pick them Uh, you can follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider I'm Todd Furman you of course can follow me there as well most importantly as always follow the podcast at 
Bet the Board Pod. And Payne, six games broken down. We've d- deep dive. We've uh, tried to uncover all of the unique aspects, the angles. Mother Nature, uh, as we talked about at the top of the show, going to play a major role in terms of how some of these games will get decided. You hate to see it with playoff implications there. I know a lot of our loyal listeners probably fighting for fantasy championships as well. Going to struggle with some of those decisions in terms of their best playmakers uh, that are out there and available in these spots. But more importantly, the actionable element, uh, I mean, on top of everything, that we've covered in terms of trying to identify the best investment for NFL Week 16. Yeah, this is one we talked a little bit about off air, and I think we we both like this one. And, you know, without sending listeners into a couple potential battles out there, this kind of makes the most sense. And you said we didn't break down a Sunday game on the podcast. Well, here you go. <laughs> this kind of fits that mold. So, you know, there's different ways to play this it started to leak out a little bit i think you know you and i both grabbed some numbers here it's still showing some value to our number and i think we just go to rotation number 477 it's the denver broncos on the money line minus a dollar 45 please shop around there's a bunch of minus 135 out there but we'll grade it minus 145 and that is certainly the better price as this has the potential and it's starting to kind of trend to three i think by the time we get to sunday night you're going to see three here so still some value in this number with the money line being better than current market price on the spread and it's only going to enhance i think that spread's going to increase a little bit but basically what i'm seeing here is a rams offense that just doesn't have a lot of juice and if you remove that fourth quarter comeback victory against the Raiders just the last two weeks you're looking at you know an offense in the Rams that are negative 0.16 EPA per play the Broncos defense is still playing extremely tough they're getting healthier on that side of the ball but I think the interesting element here is is maybe the other side of the ball Todd it's the Broncos offense and you know showed some life against Kansas City moving the ball through the air had an opportunity to to show a little bit better had Russell Wilson not gone down so you like to see at least Russell Wilson showing signs of life against Cincinnati or against uh, Kansas City rather he's going to be upgraded and he's going to play in this game and then last week got the ground game going against Arizona and I think that's the interesting element here is you showed that you could really dominate a team that's kind of in your class in Arizona although I do think Denver's better than Arizona especially in the current constructs of things but battled the prior weeks right and and so like fans will look at it and be like oh you you know you lost you lost yeah but it's like you're battling Baltimore you're battling Kansas City those are two teams that are in you know an upper echelon tier exceeded expectations by a, a, a large margin in both of those games and so I think this is just a good matchup not a home field advantage uh for the Rams here I don't know what Rams fans attending a game on on Christmas uh, for a four win team. So I, you're kind of removing that element from here and, and just kind of let me be candid, like how these teams are situated right now in the moment. And, you know, Denver's getting healthier along the offensive line as well. We saw Billy Turner return last week. That was a huge get back. Some of the guys that were beaten and battered along that line playing through some injuries, trending a little bit healthier as well. So all things said right now, how these teams are currently constructed with the injuries, and we have we have Denver, you know, pushing towards a four point favorite on a neutral. And so I don't really view the Rams of having much home field advantage here. And and thus you have the better team at a better price that's uh, playing good ball right now. And so that's that's the bet. Four seventy seven Denver Broncos money line minus dollar forty five. Again, shop around some minus one thirty five out there. I think we are going to uh, at least get to the key here of three. Let's go, Russ. Show us why you're a quarter of a billion dollar man. You can't have Brett Rippon breathing down your neck, stealing your job out there. Get out there, fling the ball around, establish the ground game. Uh, and the Broncos defense, the far superior unit to what the Broncos offense will encounter going up against the Rams. Hey, one last thing uh, I did want to ask you about, and obviously not a deep dive. I know a big game in your neck of the woods early on Sunday for the Dolphins Packers. Not a breakdown, but just what are some of the things that you might be looking for from Miami with extra time to prepare, knowing Green Bay is coming in on a short week 
I'm looking for the Dolphins to get a win here so we can go over eight and I like it. Wins. Short, That's short, succinct, and uh, establish the ground <laughs> game. Get going against that interior of the Packers defense and prove that Green Bay's win against yeah. the Rams had more to do with the Rams' ineptitude than it did anything Green Bay figuring things out offensively. But don't tell that to the mainstream media, Payne, because the Packers have an excellent chance uh, in the wake of their dominant performance as a seven and a half point favorite winning by 12 against the Rams of getting into the NFC playoff picture because that's what we've grown accustomed to from Aaron Rodgers magic yeah so ultimately you know you got to a price here at six and a half that was that was a little nutty and now I think once you kind of got to the other end of the spectrum where threes were flashing like yeah that might have been a little bit nutty and so to your point late in the year rest advantage that that plays a large role we've obviously seen some over money come in here total open 46 and a half we've now seen multiple wax to the over one from 46 and a half out to 48 and a half 49 and then again this morning prior to recording another whack and we're out to 50 and so i think the thought process there is green bay has been playing outdoor games in some weather not going to have that in Miami, substantially healthier with some weapons on the outside with both Romeo and, and Watson. And we know a guy like Aaron Jones. What's his what's his forte? It's catching balls out of the backfield. And again, Miami just can't defend running back passes. So there's some some paths here for some offensive success with the Packers moving the ball through the air against a, a Dolphins secondary. That's that leaves a lot to be desired. And then on the other side, Miami's back home and They've shown extremely well offensively on, on that side of the ball. We're able to get the ground game going again last week, have the extra time to get some guys rested up and healthy. Tyree Kill put it upon himself for the loss last week, said he didn't play his best, so I'd expect a very good performance there. And so that's why we've seen some over money now. Now, I'm talking about the game, right? And so that doesn't necessarily mean run to bet over 50 and when the thing lands 49, hop in the car. Oh, absolutely, absolutely uh, not. But, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> right. So, but I just kind of, that that's what's what's transpired in this game. And I hate talking about games that have moved, you know, so much after the fact. It's kind of... Yeah, that wasn't maybe more from not what I like to do, but but that that's that's basically what's transpired so far. In, in, yeah, in it wasn't game. from a betting value standpoint. I just know it's an interesting game for a variety of reasons. Obviously, like you said, it's all about the win total for us and Miami just finding a way to get there outright. Should be a fun game to watch early on Sunday uh, on Christmas Day between the Packers and Dolphins. Any big holiday plans for you over there? Or, I mean, do you get to leave the workshop for at least twenty minutes and uh, go downstairs, make a small <laughs> donation in one of the Salvation Army red kettles in your neck of the woods, or? You you know, what is a what is a holiday weekend for pain and tail? Well, first, it's it's getting a little bit healthier because I'm I'm under the weather and kind of battled through this one. Um, the the donation fund uh, for one Keldrick Falk did not go very well. Oh, Mister Mister Hugh Freeze got us there, so uh, <laughs> might have to need a refund there. And then, yes, plenty 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 to donate to uh, the less yeah, fortunate. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure season. if that was a bona fide tax write off or how that particular bucket of things worked when you when it comes to filing <laughs> annually uh, at the end of the year. But uh, as always, want to thank all of you guys, our loyal. Uh, listeners that have been with us from the start of the season. If you've been with us since the podcast launch back in 2014, or if you're tuning in to bet the board for the very first time, want to wish you and yours a very happy and healthy holiday season. Uh, enjoy time with your loved ones. Be smart with those bankrolls just because all of these bulls and NFL games are on TV and you got nothing else to do. Uh, be judicious. We have a long season ahead and plenty of meaningful playoff games and bowl games as well. We'll be back with you on Wednesday when we preview some of the marquee games on the college slate. So remember you can follow Follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, as always, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And come Sunday afternoon with a Denver Broncos ticket in hand. Hopefully, we'll see you at the window. Thanks for listening to Bet the Board. You can catch Todd and Payne every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday during football season, breaking down the biggest NFL and college football games. And to make sure you don't miss any free best bets, subscribe to Bet the Board on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.